Well, good morning, everyone. You notice I'm uh, wearing a stole, one of my stoles. I will be explaining that as we go further into the, uh, the service. And you also might have noticed in the bulletin that I have um, added something to each of the sections of our worship service. Um, we always have, we gather before God, and I put purple for preparation and penitence. Uh, then we, our next section is we receive God's word, red for the Spirit's presence. The next section, we respond to God's call, white for holiness and reverence. And then our final section, we go in God's peace, green for hope and new life. I'll be explaining those within the context of the, uh, the sermon. So, and also why I am wearing my uh, liturgical stoles. Um... Remember, uh, next Sunday, Linda will be leading the service uh, for us since um, my vacation starts later this week, and we will not be getting together on the 26th. There will just, we'll just all take a vacation day that day, and then we will be back together the first Sunday in, in July. All righty, um, let us begin our time of worship together with a call to worship that is printed in the bulletin. This is from Psalm 8, which is the psalm that has been selected for this Sunday. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. Looking at the night sky and the work from your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place. What are mere mortals that you should think about us? Human beings that you should care for us. Yet you made us only a little lower than you yourself and crowned us with glory and honor. O oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Let us pray. Father, we praise you. Through your word and spirit, you created all things. You reveal your salvation in all the world by sending to us Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. Through your Holy Spirit, you give us a share in your life and love. Fill us with the vision of your glory that we may always serve and praise you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You might have guessed uh, that today is Trinity Sunday, and this particular hymn, number 341, Holy, 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 is one of the uh, capstones for Trinity Sunday. So our first hymn is number 341.
For God so loved the world that God gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our failure to be what you created us to be. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. By your loving mercy, help us to live in your light and abide in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Through your mercy, light our way. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world. Rather, in order that the world might be saved through him, the Father sends the Holy Spirit who pours God's love into our hearts. Through Christ, our sins are forgiven. Now raised with Christ, we may sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day, Declare his glory among the nations and do his marvelous work among all the peoples. Alleluia and Amen. All righty. Uh, some of the joys or concerns that we shared last week, uh, Mary Lee and John had, uh, were celebrating 56 years together. Um, uh, John also had an opportunity to be with his family in Akron, celebrating the life of his Aunt Hope. Uh, continued prayers for Lee, George, and Charlie, and for Lorraine, who lost her mother this past, last week. Uh, Nancy had great travels at the graduation and a brief uh, travel to a wedding. Um, thank, thanksgiving for strangers who assist one another, and continued prayers for the spirit of our world. Um, which reminds me, I forgot to mention in the announcements, tonight at 7.30, Katakton is hosting a prayer vigil for uh, Ukraine. It will be on the, the lawn. Um, hopefully the weather will cooperate with us. Uh, uh, if you want to come, bring an umbrella and something, a chair to sit on. Uh, if weather doesn't cooperate, it'll be inside at 7.30. Um, I forgot to mention that, but the prayers for the world made me think of it. So, are there any other joys or concerns that anyone would like to bring to the attention of the congregation today? Okay. So, Junior Baker had some surgery, and he's, how could I spell surgery properly? Surgery, and is doing well. Good. Anything else? Anyone else? Yeah, Linda. Linda. Okay. Also for the Wetzel family on the loss of Sherry, not the deep one down here, just somebody from Leesburg Fire Company family. Okay. Is, uh, that keeps on fair. 
still having troubles with vertigo? I'm sorry. Is she still having difficulty with vertigo? That's not good. So, okay. So it's, they're just kind of running tests and trying. The neurologist. Okay. Uh, they were able to determine that it was in the back, back here. Okay. Causing her problems. That's not great. Also, she and Rowdy had a really good week. Had lots of time to spend with my sister this week. And Joe and Sharon took us all for. Yay. We had a really good week. Good. Good. Lots of family time, especially with the June babies. And June was born in June. Yes. Um, I remember that. Uh, continued prayers for Becky, who's got something a little more serious than vertigo, and for the uh, Wexel family, who lost their daughter Sherry. Anything else? Anyone else? Chris? Um, prayers for Robert because of the um, Yeah. Um, you know, he's been having a Good. Okay, so prayers for Robert, who had another seizure and um, is facing some tests this week. And in spite of all that, is still planning on running in a marathon. And uh, Lee, whose sister was in town and was uh, very happy to be with some family. Um, uh, yes. Nikki. Yes. Oh. Oh. Thank God she she called me. Did she call you? Yes. Okay. All right, so prayers for Nikki, who uh, had a seizure for the first time in five months. Um, hopefully they'll get the medications re-figured out because she was doing so well. Okay, is there anything else or anyone else? All right. Um... We will bring those particular uh, concerns into the prayer time when we get there. Meanwhile, if you will join me in the prayer for illumination that is printed in the bulletin, let us pray together. Holy, holy, holy one, guide us by the spirit of truth to hear the word of life you speak and to give all glory, honor, and praise to your threefold name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Um, the New Testament reading for today, Trinity Sunday, comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. The lectionary committee suggested chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, but I'm going to push it on through to verse 11, just for the, the theology and for what Paul says to the faithful then and to the faithful now. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. So Romans 5, verses 1 through 11. Paul writes this. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand and we boast in our hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions, knowing that affliction produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely, therefore, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Now, before we get too far into what I'm planning on doing, I want to share with you the Greek word that Paul uses for time in verse 6. At the right time, he says. Um, usually, when we hear the word time, we look at our watches, or we look at a clock on the wall, or we pull out our phones, because for our culture, time is something that is measured. We mark days, we mark weeks, we mark months, we mark years, minutes, hours, seconds to chart growth, to see how much skills have improved, to know when to expect a service like a train or a boat. As Americans, we also measure time because time is money. This is not the word that Paul uses in Romans. That word, uh, the, the word that we use, chronos, is tick-tock goes the clock. That's what we usually hear, think of when we hear the word time, chronos. The Greek word that Paul uses is kairos. And it has nothing to do with any device that notes the passage of time. Instead, the thought behind the word kairos is a lot more subtle and seems to be a, an, an idea of time moving behind the scenes. Like we're all busy out here as actors on a stage, like Shakespeare said, we're all actors in a play playing our part, while backstage, scenery, props, costumes are being shifted around so that they'll be ready when the time comes. That's kind of an imperfect analogy because it still relies on timing. And if timing doesn't work in a stage play, uh, things can get a little exciting, particularly for the people on stage when a prop they're expecting to be there is not. If any of you have ever seen the play Noises Off, it's a farce, which is about uh, a, a play that is, is, you see it in three acts. The first act is it runs the way it's supposed to, and there's an actor actually out in the, uh, in the auditorium who's the, the, the director, and he's you know, calling directions and stuff and keeps stopping it. He says, okay, keep going. So the first act, you see it the way it's supposed to run. The second act is when things start getting a little chaotic backstage and how that messes everything up. It's really funny. If you have a chance to see it, go see it. But that's why you need um, uh, somebody who's competent behind the scenes, a competent uh, property master or a stage manner whose skills can be trusted. Paul is telling the faithful Romans that God is that someone who can be trusted. God is the one who is always moving all the time and leads events and people to the right 
time, the suitable time, the perfect time. So this might be the right time to mention what I was doing with the bulletin. <clears throat> we have four distinct colors in the church, in the Presbyterian church, the Reformed church. Uh, the Catholic church has a lot of different colors because the Catholic church is much more about the ritual of worship. Uh, they're not so, m well, I'm not going to be mean um, or, and I hope I'm not being inaccurate by saying they don't emphasize the, the, the preached word as much as we Protestant, uh, Protestants do. We emphasize the sermon a lot. Um, Catholics are much more about the sounds, the experiences, the smells, the bells is what they call it, the visual experience of worship. And so for that, uh, to that end, they have a lot of color. Liturgical colors help us remember throughout the year that God is moving in the, in the background. God is always, always in operation mode. So according to Katie Scott, who wrote an article in 2014 uh, in the Catholic Herald, the first person to systematize the Roman Catholic color scheme was Pope Innocent III, who was pontiff from the years 1198 to 1216. So this idea of the use of colors for the church year is a really old one. Uh, uh, and that pope, Pope Innocent, uh, named four liturgical colors, white, red, black, and green. During the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, much about Roman styles of worship got tossed out because, of course, they were rejecting everything about the way the Catholic Church had worked at that time. But within the last century, Protestants have recovered some of those elements of worship uh, in order to help worshipers center thoughts and hearts while in God's presence. Sometimes having something to look at, be it colors, hear something, be it bells, or we did incense one time, but that kind of you know, incense can really get you if you're not used to smells. Um, helps focus your attention and remind you, you are in a worship space in the presence of God. So I started off wearing my purple stole, and purple uh, represents two different things in two different seasons. At the beginning of the church year in Advent, purple is the color because purple is one of the signs of preparation. When we are in the season of Advent, we are preparing ourselves for the coming of the baby at Christmas. And so purple is the color at that time to get us ready for that. We take a little bit of a sidestep on the third Sunday of Advent and do pink or rose for the joy that Mary experienced uh, particularly when her cousin Elizabeth said, who are you to, to be coming? And, and my baby leapt in my womb when it saw you. So there's this joy of, of what Mary has been uh, tasked with doing, bringing the light into the world. So purple is a symbol of preparation. In the season of Lent, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention. Uh, so I wore purple at the beginning of our service with the call to worship and the opening prayer. Um, to come into God's presence. The call to worship, opening prayer. I, I try to find or adapt prayers that speak to God's majesty and power, the works of God in creation and history, and in our lives and in the world today. Uh, this preparation is anchored with the opening hymn that sings about God's power, might, and glory. And today's uh, opening hymn was a good one for that, Holy, Holy, Holy. Uh, be, mostly because Holy, Holy, Holy comes straight out of the book of Revelation. Remember me reading that a few weeks ago? Holy, 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 uh, God of power and might. Then we move to purple representing penitence in the season of Lent. And I continued to wear uh, purple at the beginning of the service when we did the call to confession, the prayer of confession as a body, and then leaving some time for silent confession. We conclude with a responsive uh, assurance of pardon and in a lot of churches, that's where people pass the peace, 
since everyone has been forgiven in Jesus Christ, we are now at peace, as Paul says in verse 1, and we are able to forgive one another and pass the peace to others as we have received. Uh, we, we saved that passing of the peace for the conclusion of our worship service, uh, and I'll get to the conclusion of our worship service in a minute. Um, at that point where a lot of people pass the peace, we share joys and concerns, and we take time to extend grace and mercy by bringing people's hearts before God, the things that are weighing on their hearts, the things that are making their hearts light and joyful. So purple is for preparation in Advent and penitence in Lent. So that's why we have the color purple, which is also a very good book. Then we've moved into the next section of our worship service, and I'm wearing red. Red is where uh, is um, the color of fire, and it symbolizes the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Uh, last week at Pentecost, I was wearing red because of that. Um, believe me when I tell you, I pray to the Spirit every Sunday as this part of the sermon service comes around, the reading of the scripture and the sermon. Uh, I, I also, as I'm leading this part of the service, I listen for the Spirit uh, because it might it move me to include or omit something in what I've prepared. And there have been times while I'm speaking that a thought comes to me that's so much better than what I had prepared that I abandon what's right here in my screen and I follow that. I've learned that when the Spirit nudges me to uh, peek down a side corridor or look into a side room, it's usually because someone needs to hear something that I hadn't considered. And sometimes a person is me. So I mentioned earlier that often there's a stage manager that moves behind the scenes, getting things ready, getting people and places into place so that when it is the right time, things can happen. I think that is the spirit, the spirit of God, who is nimble, who is swift, who is always prepared, who is always prepares what we need or who we need. Sometimes the spirit locks a door that should not be opened. I've had those experiences where I've wanted to do something and the spirit just kind of got in the way and said, no, you're not gonna do that right now. I, I appreciate your, your passion and your, and your ingenuity, but this isn't the right time, sit down. Or sometimes we can resist the spirit that's urging us into action. Sometimes you've got a sense that, oh, I really ought to get up and go do that, and then things happen, and later you think, oh, man, I should have done that. Yet, the spirit is like a river. When it needs to, it'll go around obstacles and try again downstream. I think our lives and I think our world would be so much better served by Jesus' disciples if we paid better attention to this person of the Trinity. Listen for the way the Spirit moves and listen when the Spirit says, sit still. Now white, I love this stole, it's reversible. <laughs> white symbolizes purity, holiness, virtue, as well as respect and reverence. White and gold represent days and seasons of joy and mark the pivotal events in the life of Christ. So I arranged the colors in today's worship service as a way to anchor the meaning of the color. Our prayer time could also be read for how the Spirit may move us as we pray or as we commune with one another. It could also be purple. We may spend time in silent prayer during the time when I leave silence for uh, prayer to continue the confession from earlier. But I think to come to God in prayer must be done with respect and reverence, so that's why I put white there. White is the color for the seasons of Easter and Christmas, joyful times in our lives with Jesus, the coming of the baby at Christmas and his resurrection from the dead at Easter. Green, which is 
what we have on our cross now. Green is the color of new vegetation, and it symbolizes uh, the hope of new life, which is ours in Jesus Christ. My sister made this stole for me when I was ordained 32 years ago. Uh, it's, it, she put, the, she put the, the fabric together, sewed in the little uh, thing that keeps it centered on my back, and did all this cross-stitching. It's one of the best gifts I was given when I was ordained. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> um, I put green at the end of the service because I always hope that when we leave here, when we leave being gathered together every Sunday morning, that we go out with fresh eyes, fresh hearts, fresh minds, with hands and feet ready to do what we can to plant seeds and nourish others with what God offers. So liturgical colors can help us remember what God has done and what God will still do. We can use these colors to center our hearts to worship, but mostly uh, we can know that God is always acting at the right time, every time. God is always present, sometimes right in front of us in the eyes and faces of other faithful people, and sometimes as we look out the windows or just go outside and be in creation. In Jesus and through the Spirit, God goes with us every day, all the way. So Paul knows in his letter to the Romans that this road of faith is not always easy. And so he tells the Roman Christians that we can, against all evidence to the contrary, have hope and rejoice. We can even boast and the word in Greek means live with your head high, confident that we have a secure foundation. When things are going well, yeah, sure, we can do that. We can boast. We can hold our heads high and be assured and have confidence. But Paul pushes us out of that mindset by telling us that we can boast, live with eyes up, secure in our being, secure in the knowledge of love of Jesus Christ, even when circumstances bring affliction. Now, the Greek word that is used there, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. There's a lot of consonants that come together. Um, but it can also mean pressure. What constricts or what rubs together. Think of a machine, an engine that doesn't have a lot of oil. Grum, grum, grum or a narrow place that hems someone in. If you're claustrophobic, this is a horrible thought. Uh, tribulation, especially internal pressure, that causes someone to feel confined, restricted, or without options. We all know those feelings. We know what it feels like to rub against something. We know what it feels like to be pressed, hard pressed. But Paul says, rejoice, boast in that, because Jesus Christ knew the exact same thing. And we have a companion who will be right next to us in that time. If we can remember that, we will endure. And that endurance will train us, and like an athlete, or a dancer, or a singer, or a teacher, or a nurse, or any other kind of professional person, it will build character in us. Gosh, this is tough, but I can do it. And if we find it in ourselves to say that, I can do it, then we can hope that in all times, at the right time, we will abide with God at our side. So thanks be to God who created us, who redeemed us, who sustains us, and who is with us every day of the year. Thanks be to God for the gift of grace given to us through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen.
our second hymn is number 39. Our prayers this morning are uh, from a man named John Birch, who writes a website called Faith and Worship. Um, I'm using a big chunk of his stuff for the season of Pentecost. So, let us approach God in faith and in hope. Let us pray. Creator God, who breathed this world into being, who is discernible within the harmony of nature, the perfection of a butterfly's wing, the grandeur of a mountain range, the soaring eagle and hummingbird, thank you for this world which you have created. Thank you for summer sun, which reminds us that your creative breath is still alive and active. Thank you for the warmth of your love, sustaining this world, your garden. That we can glimpse you within creation is a beautiful thought, but it also tells us you desire to be seen, to be found and known. Open our eyes, Lord, as we walk through this world. Feel the breezes and the sunshine. See the majesty of creation unfolding before our eyes. Help us see you.
You grant us faith when hearts are troubled. Perseverance when the going is tough. Peace when our spirits are low. Strength enough. You grant us hope when all seems hopeless. You grant forgiveness when we are tempted to stray. Your hands reach out to embrace us and welcome us in. For peace, faith, hope, we give you thanks. We pray for our world, almighty God. We pray for these dear ones who are close to our hearts. For Junior Baker, whose surgery has come and gone and is doing well. We pray that you will continue to surround Tina. Lord, hold her close. Surround her family, surround her friends. May her time be Kairos time, your time. And we pray for the Wexel family and the loss of Sherry. Lord, we know so many people who grieve and our prayer for them is always the same. Be with them, comfort them. And as it is possible, use us to do those things. We pray that you will be with Becky, that you will be with the neurologists who are overseeing her case, and that she will get some answers. We're very grateful for time spent with family and time coming up to be spent with family. And we pray for Robert and Nikki, each of whom had seizures. Lord, it's frustrating not to know what to be able to do and to be so far away, particularly for Robert. And so we pray that your spirit will not only surround them, giving them health, giving them wholeness, but that your spirit will surround those who love them, giving them peace and comfort. Heal these people in mind, body, or circumstance and work in them by your grace, almighty God, wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. And we pray today, gracious God, that you would comfort and relieve all those who are in trouble, all those whose afflictions are pressing them hard, all those who sorrow, all those who are dwelling in poverty, either economic, spiritual, emotional. We pray you will be with those who are dealing with illness, mind, body, or spirit. And especially, God, we pray for those who grieve. We pray for these known to us and those known only to you. Hear us as we bring our hearts before you in a time of silence.
light of the world. Through your grace and mercy, may each new day be a day to be embraced, each encounter and conversation a chance to show in word and deed the difference that your light has made. We pray all of these things in the glorious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying these words together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God is the Father who created us, nurtures us, and prepares a future for us beyond all imagining. God is the Son who came to our aid in human form, who teaches us a more fulfilling way, and by the grace of the cross, delivers us from responding to evil with evil. God is the Spirit who is among us, creating the community of the church and inspiring us to deeds of justice and mercy. So let us return to this God, our gratitude, as we offer our gifts and our lives. Let us pray together. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is number 291.
now, my friends, go out into this world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what's good. Return no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people, rejoicing that the power of the Holy Spirit gives you to do those things and so very much more. And now may the love of the God who created you, the peace of the God who redeemed you, and the strength of the God who sustains you be with you now, this day, and always. Go with God, my friends. Go in peace. Amen. Please greet one another with the words of the ancient church. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Thank you. Peace be with you. Thank you. Happy birthday to you too. Peace, Destin. Glad you all were here. <laughs>